Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. My name is Gary Pollan, and this week my co-host is Jim Granado of the Hobby School of Public Affairs. And our guest this week is Lawrence Wright, Pulitzer Prize winning author for The Looming Tower, and he has a great new book out that uh, both of us have read and enjoyed, God Save Texas. Uh, Lawrence, uh, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Uh, I started reading your book, I think, three months ago because uh, we kept hearing you're coming, yeah. you're coming, yeah. and uh, you finally got to Houston, so we're glad to have you. I'm always happy to be in Houston. So uh, the first question I wanted to ask you about the book is, why did you decide to write about Texas and your observations about Texas? Well, you know, I came to Texas in 19, returned to Texas because I grew up in Dallas and Abilene, but uh, came back in 1980 to work for Texas Monthly. And uh, when I left Texas Monthly, I thought, I'll never write about Texas again. You know, I, for one thing, I was tired of doing it, and I didn't want to be seen as a regional writer. But, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, at the New Yorker, uh, my editor, David Remnick, came to me and said, I'd like for you to explain Texas. Because a lot of people don't understand why right. I would live in Texas. And uh, I realized there's a lot of explaining to do. And I also told him I get paid by the word, so <laughs> he has a big question you asked. But I suddenly had an appetite uh, for writing about my home state and under trying to get people who are outside of the state to understand it, and also helping people who live in the state to see it through the eyes that, of someone who has reservations but also a great deal of love for the state. You have a chapter devoted to culture in the yeah. book. Tell us about that. Well, this may not apply to all cultures, but in <laughs> Texas, I think, uh, I see it as having three levels. And uh, it's easy in Texas because you know, level one is the basics. And level one is barbecue and cowboy boots and belt buckles and rodeos and everything everybody recognizes as Texan. Yeah. Stuff you can load up at Bucky's on, you know, right. that's all level one Texas. And, uh, and when I was a kid, that was you know, what we had, really, you know, it was chili and, you know, just, you know, basic foods. Um, so level two is when money enters the equation. And money, people start looking around. What do other cultures have? You know, what, how do they, you know, so then that's the point where museums start to come in, dance companies. Uh, you start sending your kids away to school. You take European vacations and then uh, the phenomenon of the world-class architecture comes in. And uh, there was a phrase that Ross Perot kind of popularized, uh, world-class, you know, so that was a level two phrase. So everything had to be at a high level of uniformity. So all the cities look alike and they have the same kinds of cultural institutions. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stage that's marked with um, a kind of shame about level one, you know, trying to disavow your roots. And I think level three, uh, is when you have grown through all of that and uh, you're able to go back to level one with a sense of forgiveness and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming to this realization at Cafe Annie here in Houston mm -hmm. and uh, I had uh, the rabbit taco and uh, it was a it was clearly a level three accomplishment. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> that's something you'd expect normally. No. Right. You'd have to go through all three stages in order to get there, though. Was it good? It was very good. And, you know, like Beyonce and Lemonade, uh, coming back to her Houston roots and the country and western sounds and the church sounds that she grew up with. Uh, those are, you know, uh, Alvin Ailey you know, came from this little fly speck Texas town called Rogers, and his greatest dance was uh, Revelation, which is all about, you know, the, being in that black Baptist church. Mm -hmm. that, that, I think, nowadays in Texas, we can say that, you know, the, the culture has achieved a level of maturity that is both distinctly Texan, but also informed by all the great traditions in the world. What about our politics? It's different. Yes. Uh, well, you know, well, you talked about AM Texas and FM Texas, which I thought was a good distinction. Excuse me. You can ride through the state and be in two places at the same time. And if, you, if you're listening to AM radio, you'll, for one thing, it's a lot like AM radio everywhere. You get Rush and Laura and all the, and you get the, the Pentecostal stations and, and lots and lots of ads. But it is hardcore and red. And then you can turn it turn the dial to the FM, and you're in progressive Texas, the urban Texas. And these two Texases don't talk to each other very much. 
um, a, a, an example of that, I think, is that uh, Dan Patrick, who was a shock jock here on AM radio, uh, <coughs> when he got elected to uh, lieutenant governor, he was invited to go on to uh, the Texas Standard uh, NPR program in Austin and uh, was asked about uh, gun rights. And he said, it was a mistake to come on the show. And he got up and walked away. And I, it, he literally couldn't talk uh, to someone uh, who was in the, the opposite dial from the AM band. Well, that's unfortunate. It's it's because <clears throat> one of the problems, haven't you noticed, as is, is an observer and a writer, that politics today that nobody's talking to anybody. Yeah. You talk to people who agree with you 100 percent, and the others you just ignore. Turn past them. You know, it's it's part of the kind of tribalism of our politics, and I I think it's when when you have the kind of impasse that we've come to in this country and in this state that issues simply too difficult to address. And so we, instead of doing that, what we do is we pick really divisive issues, things that won't advance us, but create fights. And uh, to me, an example is immigration. This is a political problem that can be politically solved. And there, are, he, nobody's advancing, nobody from either party is advancing a sober and realistic and bipartisan approach to solving a problem that is really a problem for our state probably more than any other state. Well, basically, the policy nationally isn't just neglect. Both parties have neglected the issue. Yeah. They throw rhetorical bombs at the other party and attack, but when the chance comes <clears throat> to come together and compromise on a, on a plan that might work, you There's can't no, find people. That's you right. Can't, from either party. So, I mean, this is both parties are, are doing this. Well, and I, I remember well enough an era where Texas was really bipartisan. And when George Bush was elected governor and the Senate and the House, uh, State House, were, uh, were both led by Democrats, they endorsed him for president, if you recall. And uh, it was a period, I think, in which Texas was very well governed. And one of the things about it is that the legislation that came out of that time was durable because there was agreement. And I think one lesson that we've learned nationally is that things that are put through by party fiat are only there temporarily. It's like, you know, to cite a Barack exa uh, Obama example, all those executive signings, gone. the next tidal wave that comes in, there's just footsteps in the sand, they're gone. Well, is there a reason you can identify why uh, both sides can't talk any more civilly to each other, be with each other socially? Do you have any thoughts on how, how, did, that, how did we get into this position? I think part of it is uh, the internet and, uh, and the creation of the partisan press. Um, I love the internet and I love the press, but uh, both of them are suffering from a disease. And the disease is, is, can be characterized as an echo chamber uh, where people have their, their prejudices reinforced. Instead of getting illuminated, by reading the paper or watching the news or, or going on the your book. Yes. If you're a conservative, reading your book is, you can learn something and you get a different perspective. And when you get so reinforced in, in your prejudice, uh, and also you enlist things that are not facts as part of your argument. And uh, that is infuriating. And I think, you know, the press is, you know, the press has been under assault for a long time. You know, it's been, losing money for decades. And you know, this town used to have more than one newspaper and you know, there were a lot more outlets and they, they were seen as being neutral, nonpartisan. And uh, now the press is seen and I think is far more partisan than it was in the past. And I think it's a lo terrible loss for our country. Let's turn to your younger years for students out there because I, there's a very important chapter in, part of the book where you talk about your your interview with the uh, legendary Molly Ivins mm -hmm. and you didn't get the job. Oh, yeah. So in terms of that's a that's in one level it's a big failure, but obviously it wasn't fatal. So for students out there, what happened? This was for the Texas Observer. Yes, and I they didn't pay I, anything anyway. I grew up reading the Texas Observer. My mother uh, subscribed to it and uh, I, you know it was it was a it was an example of the partisan press. Uh, 
But you know, we had the Dallas Morning News as a counterweight, and that was cons very conservative yeah. then. And, in that uh, era. So, uh, and it or opened up a window on Texas politics that nobody had ever seen before. You know, that kind of intimate disclosure with a very ribald sense of humor behind it. Oh, she was hilarious. <laughs> and so it was it was delicious. And people love Molly, even those people who, that she lampooned, because she was, uh, she, she understood, I think there's something valuable about being really understood and seen, even if you don't agree. And Molly understood. And I think she also cherished the culture that she was a part of. Uh, I mean, she was educated at the Sorbonne. She didn't have to be a Texan, right? She liked barbecue. Yes, mm -hmm. but she would. No, you're right, and I, and I and I, you know, obviously, I, I I read the Observer starting in college. Even though I've been a conservative forever, I thought it was important again yeah. to read what the other side's writing. And I liked the writing was good. You learned yeah. a lot of things you may not have read in in the normal press that was normally conservative. So very good, and I, and I loved to play about her too, which I thought was just terrific. It was wonderful. But I did want to quibble with you on one. You yeah. said not in your book, but recently you described Beto O'Rourke as the most talented political figure I've ever seen in Texas. I think he must have been wearing blinders because I find him to be one of the weakest political characters and greatly overrated. And by the way, comparing him to RFK, which somebody did, is just a total joke. I saw, I saw RFK at a speech in 1968 when he was running for president, and I was blown away with his charisma and what he brought to the table. Uh, I happen to think the most talented of the modern history politician in Texas was Ann Richards who I thought was just a terrific, outsized personality, who probably, by the way, would have won re-election against Bush if she had taken him more seriously, uh, because she was, uh, she was Texas. She I would, really I had would, a lot going for her, I, which, I, by the way, would have really changed history when you think about that. I know. Uh, I, I'm totally the opposite of you on this. I, going back to Molly, uh, when George Bush entered the race, her approval rating was 60%. Right. And she was still popular when he beat her. So that's not a good politician if she can lose and still be pol and she no, it's true that she didn't not good. she didn't she, but that's not being serious. a good politician didn't take him serious now in in case of Beto he's his the he has worked harder on this campaign than anyone I've ever seen in Texas and historically it reminds me of Lyndon Johnson in 1937 who won that campaign but it was a close, close call. I remember. And, uh, Maybe I read about it. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say you, 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 you hold up pretty well. Yes. And in, and 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 in terms of consequence, it would probably be uh, as important as John Tower's election to the Senate in 1960. So Beto is a, he's in a, given the odds against him. A weak ticket. Oh, he's a he's a, he's, he's he's in a party that is crippled in inane, and and he's doing this all on his own. And so, and to come as close as he is, I think it's a heroic effort. Yeah, if he'd run in California, he'd, he'd win. Oh yeah, he would certainly. Or New York, he'd yeah. beat the incumbents. No, there. he would. Yeah. But uh, but I don't entirely agree with the presumption that uh, that Ted Cruz represents the average Texan. I think that you know he. I think he's to the right of the average Texan, and I think Beto is to the left. So. To me, the problem with this midterm election is that the center has been hollowed out and is increasingly hollowed out. And you know, the question is: Is there a way in which our politics can come together where you you have a, a member of one party that may not be your party gets elected? It's okay; it's a good person, and you know, or vice versa. But we don't have that now. So we have a polarity. Maybe it'll tell us that uh, the next great success for the national political parties will be the party that gets back to the center. Because typically what we find in elections is, you know, especially presidential elections, they run to their base in the primaries and they run to the center for the election in order to get elected because the country's thought of as That's not what happened century. recently, though, is no, it? No, no. Yeah. This last time, no. They mm -hmm. ran to the opposite direction, which is part of the problem. The other thing I would suggest to you as a big problem is the, poli the politicking never ends. We never get a break. We used mm -hmm. to get, you talk about Bush and working with uh, Governor Hobby and others, we would have opportunities during, uh, after the election's over, yeah. to actually govern for a while, right. before the next election starts. Now the election cycles overlap each other, there's never a break, and, and now it's toxic to even talk to the other side. Socialize, have dinner with them. You're thought of as some kind of traitor yeah. who will be challenged in the primary by that party's base. Well, and, and there's an absence of seriousness about dealing with the issues that face us. And uh, to me, uh, 
there are two that I find very characteristic of our politics in, in Texas right now that are very troubling. Um, one is the wall. Now, I've written a lot about terrorism. I believe that a nation should be able to control its borders. And I don't think that a wall may be the best thing to do, but I have no problem with trying to patrol and keep people out who haven't been invited in. Uh, but, you know, the wall that we really need is a seawall. Uh, you know, just a year ago, not too much more than that, you know, Houston was drowning. Uh, we're in this space because, you know, right. you know uh, and the amount of damage that nature can do versus that that a terrorist can do is just so much more profound. So the real prerogative, I think, in our state is we have to build infrastructure, uh, not only for the amazing amount of growth that we have, but to protect us from the forces of nature. Uh, and as long as we're led by these cli climate change skeptics, I don't think they're going to invest that kind of money. And the other thing is, that, you know, our schools. Uh, we are we're in real trouble. We've you know, spent $2,500 less per student than any other state in, in the country, and we're 49th or 50th, and, and in our last nation's report card, fourth graders were uh, 45th in the nation in Texas. So these are our citizens and our future leaders and workers. And it's all been funneled into this incredibly crass and cynical idea of property tax. You know, when the state has reduced its, redu its contribution to 38%, when it's supposed to have a majority uh, of the contribution to education, and all that money is supplied by property tax. You know, the state contribution goes down, property tax goes up. Let's cut the property tax. What are we doing? Are we waging war on the schools? Are we just trying to keep our kids from not being educated? It's that's I, already happening. It is as happening. You notice. I you know. notice when you deal with young people coming out of school, and um, and Houston is a prime example. We also have other issues, not just money. We have a totally dysfunctional school board. They cannot function. Yeah. They can't make decisions. And the school district suffers, and the children suffer. Uh, I think we, I think the one point, Jim, I would agree with uh, you on is that we we need to have a, a statewide discussion about dealing with future threats from the, from nature, right. whatever cause. I mean, this the climate debate for me, it's irrelevant. It's happening. Why it's happening, yeah. I don't really care. It is happening. And what did we spend? 160 at 160 billion dollars in damage because of Harvey, right. something in that range. And they could build the Ike Dyke for like 15 or 20 billion. Right. So why yeah. don't we do it? Yeah. Why aren't we doing the things we need to do instead of waiting for the next storm and we have another 160 the billion absence, of damage? Absence it's ridiculous. Of leadership and, and ideology that stand in our way. And so if, if we can if we can be reasonable and talk about the real problems that we face, I mean, Texas, I think I don't think it's that sunk in to Texans how much of the future is in our hands. Because 10% of all the school children in America are Texans right now. And by 2050, Texas is projected to double in size, right. at which time it'll be about the size of California and New York combined. Right. So it's not just us. Our nation's future is in our hands and the decisions that we make. Well, that's why you wrote the book, right? It's one of the reasons, <laughs> yeah. So uh, talking about education, uh, it, it's, is it the answer in your mind just spending more money? Or is, it, or is it a number of things we need to do in order to get our education right for our kids? It, it would be insane to think that we can do education on the cheap, but that's what we're doing. Uh, we spend less money and, 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 and the results show it. Now, I'm not in favor of, of, of just spending, you know, building elaborate school buildings and stuff like that. Or elaborate stadiums, how about that? <laughs> it's one of your projects. I, I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Well, but I think uh, if we want to have, uh, if we want to be the leader of, of America, we are going to be the leader of America. That's our destiny. But is, are we going to be up to the challenge? And to not do it seems to me fundamentally un-Texan. Any thoughts on uh, uh, how, how, how the tax system should work? Because a lot of people complain that their property taxes continue to go up year after year. The, the schools they believe don't produce and don't reform, and they don't think they're getting the bang for the buck they need from local government either. Because if you notice coming here today, the infrastructure in the city is deteriorating. It's already not adequate. And, you know, Houston is, 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 you know, like all the cities, is growing so rapidly, and we can't even, the infrastructure needs that we have presently. Um, I'm not going to. 
tell you how I would manage it. I, I, I do think that... Well, they're sure looking for answers, I can tell you that. I don't think they're looking very hard. <laughs> I, I think I, that may be the problem. I, I, my, my feeling is that, you know, there's a dictum, you cannot raise taxes. And, you know, constantly cut, cut, cut. Well, there's a point at which you cut out the basic things that government is supposed to do. The two things that government, well, three, uh, y you should be able to educate your children. Uh, you, sh you should provide the infrastructure that state needs to survive, and then you should provide for the safety and health of your citizens. And that's where, in all three categories, we're failing. And what does it cost? It costs what it costs if, if you're going to do those things, but, when, but there's a cost in not doing them that is far more profound, just as you were saying about the, the, how much it costs for Harvey. By not protecting not just our most populous city, but, you know, the oil and gas resources that we have on the Gulf Coast, that's our, probably our most precious economic resource. Just think about what would happen, uh, not just to Texas. Take a look at the pipeline map, and you'll see the whole country is dependent on, on that little region. And if we are uh, going to allow some catastrophic storm to overwhelm it, I can't imagine what kind of economic consequences there will be. Yeah, it's pretty scary, isn't it, Neil? It is, I mean, especially through the ship channel. Turning to Houston a little bit, you have a chapter on that, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful chapter. What do you see, we have several strengths here, but we also have some challenges. What do you see going forward in terms of what Houston's going to become? Well, you know, it's, uh, my friend Mimi Swartz says we could be either London or Lagos. And, <laughs> um, you know, it is a profound choice because there's a lot of things that, that Houston has, you know, energy, of course, is, you know, but what's intriguing to me in this last oil recession, the Texas economy didn't buckle as it always has in the past, and nor did Houston. Uh, the city and the state have diversified enough that we can survive uh, a downbeat in, in the oil industry. So it shows that this, you know, the, the economy has matured in, in a profound way. So you're not, the, that fundamental vulnerability mm. that was always present mm. in Houston is not as big a factor as it was in the past. Right. So that's a huge thing. Right. Uh, secondly, I think that Houston has taken advantage of its diversity. There are other cities that see it as a, a liability. But you know, Texas, uh, especially Houston, has often cited as being the most diverse city in America, welcomes the diversity and sees the utility of it, mm -hmm. and it draws people to Houston because they feel like they can be a part of the city yes. and not, a, not an adjunct. Here in Houston, I think people come and they feel like they'll be included. That's a tremendous magnet that overcomes all the flying roaches and the, right, you know, some, right, the right, some of the other right, liabilities. Right. The, that humidity, you, the humidity. Yeah, that's, that's right. That, a lot of that. But uh, and uh, in the educational institutions are growing up, the arts district and stuff yeah. like that. There's and the parks. I mean, the way that the city. Had, see, when I was growing up in Dallas, we looked down on Houston, and uh, it was just seen as being kind of a good place for country music and barbecue, which it still is. Yeah. But it's so much more uh, sophisticated, enjoyable, and interesting uh, a place to live. Uh, and I, I now really welcome the opportunities that I have to come visit this town. Well, that's really nice of you. And you, and you do have a, you have a band. Yeah, I do. And, uh, we're, we're, what are you called? Hoodoo, W-H-O-O-D-O. Okay, what kind of music do you play? We play blues and rockabilly. Okay, and, and do you enjoy doing that? Are you going to give up being an author for that? No, but it would be close. I, I, if you could I, make money, yeah. I took yeah. up the piano when I was 38 and a half in order to play Great Balls of Fire on my 40th birthday. Wow. <laughs> and I'm still taking lessons. And, uh, and I hide behind everybody else in the band who are really great. But uh, playing music with your friends is about as much fun as you can have as an adult. Well, that's wonderful that you, that you do that as a hobby. Yeah. And it's legal, too. <laughs> so far, yeah. so what, what do you what are you working on next? You got a new book, or you're just uh, yeah, I'm working on a musical play? about Texas politics. Oh wow! And uh, we're gonna uh, do a little uh, preview of it at the Alley Theater in January in their New Works Festival. Oh well, well I will make sure that I. I, I come see that. I'm, I, I'm an Alley subscriber. I, I, I like culture. You know, I'm well, a cultured conservative, too. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I had a play at the Alley last March. It was supposed to have been... Oh, that was a great fall. story that you yeah. wrote about, too, is yeah. what happened. We have, we have about a minute left. Yeah. 
But I, I went to, I, I got to go see the play. Oh, it I'm was, delighted. It was done at U of A. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was wonderful. Well, yeah. good for you. Well, thank You're doing you. an awesome job. Uh, you know, I wish you were more conservative, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, God Save Texas, folks, is a great book and it's worth reading. You'll actually learn something. And Jim Granato from the Hobby School of Public Affairs, I appreciate you coming down this week and helping me uh, interview this wonderful guest. Glad to be here. We'll be back next week on Red, White, and Blue with another exciting and interesting guest or guests.